Good morning, everybody. We're going to get started. Um, this panel is called Fair and Balanced or False Equivalence. Uh, my name is Indira Lakshmanan. I'm the executive editor at the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting, and I have a terrific panel here today who are really some of the three best people I could think of to talk about this because they think about it long and hard, and I have a uh, heard them all, heard their thoughts, and uh, I think they're worth sharing. So sitting right next to me is Craig Newmark. He's the founder of Craigslist. He's really a, a passionate proponent of ethics and facts and journalism, truth-telling, fact-checking, and he's a major benefactor of mission-driven news and anti-misinformation initiatives. Um, sitting next to Craig is Rachel Smolkin. Um, she is a very familiar face in Washington journalism. She's vice president and executive editor of CNN Politics. So keep those questions, because I know you're going to have a lot. And uh, sitting next to Rachel is Jay Rosen, who is a, st a distinguished professor at um, New York University, the author of books, a very um, frequent participant on Twitter, on every journalism <laughs> debate and discussion you can think of, and, I'm, and also the author of the Press Think blog. So I'm sure you guys are quite familiar with Jay as well. Um, so I want to start out this conversation by, you know, this, this is something that we've been talking about in journalism for at least a few years. And the question of whether we are working so hard in mainstream journalism to give both sides of every issue to appear fair, to not appear to be, um, you know, putting our thumb on the scales in either direction of a candidate or a situation that some people have accused us of false equivalence, of saying, you know, you're trying to give both sides to climate change. There is no other side, you know, science or um, there, you know, uh, many other issues like that that a lot of news consumers as well as some journalists say have already been litigated. And if they've already been litigated, why are we still talking about them and acting as if each side is equally legitimate? So, um, Craig, let me ask you first, because you're not only a news consumer, but you're a funder of many organizations that are looking to, in various ways, increase trust in news. Um, is this thing of fair and balanced versus false equivalence, is this your biggest worry? Is this the biggest issue we're facing in the news? Well, I'm a news consumer. You know, I've never spent real time in a newsroom, haven't had to write uh, articles to deadline. So I'm speaking in some ignorance. But uh, I think the biggest issue in uh, news these days is uh, trust, uh, trustworthy journalism. And from my point of view, uh, you earn trust by continuous uh, ethical behavior. You know, you start off with a uh, ethical code that says things like, thou shalt not bear false witness. Then you do fact checking. And when you present the news, you know, you uh, get people who are telling you uh, the truth. You might not want to do things like giving airtime to someone that you know is going to attempt to disinform you. You may not want to give airtime to someone whose sole job is to deceive people. Now, sure, if you're a skilled enough interviewer, you can use uh, different techniques, to, uh, including fact-checking, to uh, deal with that. You could use what Margaret Sullivan calls a truth sandwich to uh, deal with the mistruths, meaning uh, you know, letting people know that the following may be misinformation um, and then telling people why. Uh, tangentially, I should mention that I'm talking about uh, not gray areas, because the world is dominated by gray areas. But in the news today, we see lots and lots of uh, black and white mistruths. The uh, folks at the Washington Post do a really good job uh, with their uh, Pinocchio meter, for example, and that there's also a PolitiFact. So the deal is that, you know, objectivity was developed about a century ago, show two sides of a story, big improvement, but please don't bring on anyone who you know is going to attempt to disinform folks. Uh, only do that if your interviewer is skilled enough to defeat that, and very, very few interviewers are that skilled. Uh, this is a subject which deserves a lot of length. 
I'll only end by saying that, you know, again, a lot of what we hear in the news, uh, there are two sides. A lot of what we hear, there's a lot of gray areas. I'm talking about black and white truth or mistruth, of which there's a great deal in the news. Let me um, sort of build on what you've said a little bit in terms of the truth sandwich for those people who may not be familiar with it. It's based on a concept from the linguist um, George Lakoff, who's a Berkeley emeritus professor and has written many books on linguistics, language, and politics. And um, he, and there's a wonderful um, journalist at The New Yorker called Maria Konnikova, who writes a lot about psychology. Thank you. And um, she... Um, has has talked to me about this too and explaining that the truth sandwich for them is that, and this has come up because we have a president in Donald Trump who is, um, you know, who has a predilection to repeat untruths over and over. Even when he's been fact-checked, he just doubles down on them. Even when, you know, organizations like the Washington Post fact-checker or Pointers PolitiFact say that's wrong, he'll just repeat and repeat and repeat. So the criticism that many people have made is that by the media simply repeating the lie, and that becomes the headline, even if four paragraphs later in the story, it's fact-checked, and it, people say, that's not, you know, of course the journalist says, that's not right, that the problem is that just by having it in the headline, that's what imprints on the brain, on the memory, that's what people remember. So the suggestion of the truth sandwich is to put the truth first, um, so say it would be something like, immigrants of all kinds commit crime at a lower rate than native-born Americans. So you have the truth first, then you say, but today President Donald Trump said blank, 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 and then you return to the facts and why that's untrue. So that's the truth sandwich concept, so that the, the headline that imprints in people's brains um, would not be the false information that is then disproved, um, and that is actually one criticism of why fact checks are not especially effective because people remember the lie rather than the truth. Um, all right, so I wanted to ask you, Rachel, uh, first give you the chance to respond a little bit to what Craig said because I think when he said don't bring someone on TV who lies or you know spins in a way that is beyond spinning, he might be referring to people like Kellyanne Conway and others who, uh, who you know, still appear on all major U.S. air, not just your air. Um, but there's a lot of criticism of um, cable news and network news for continuing to bring on um, people who are proven to have lied repeatedly. So can you first give me a response to that? Yeah, there you see. There we go. Uh, so I um, agree with Craig that the framing is very important, and that if you are going to uh, bring particular folks on who uh, are fact challenged, that the interviewing is very important. We have very skilled interviewers like Jake Tapper who are who are quite good at that. Uh, my area is uh, the digital arm of CNN. I run the digital coverage in Washington and oversee uh, our digital coverage of Washington and politics. So we are facts-led. We're a facts-first organization. I think that journalists always have to follow the facts and go where the facts take us, whether that is uh, during a, a live interview that we are um, sharing real time with our audiences on various platforms, or the follow-up to that interview, the analysis, the takeaways, the fact-checking, and we've really stepped up our fact-checking at CNN this year, uh, really framing things along with our facts first brand uh, and giving bottom line conclusions, but not forcing ourselves into a false equivalency. I think that presenting both sides or multiple sides, because most issues have more than two sides, is very important. We, we come from a position of being down the middle. So it's our, our job to present various perspectives. That does not mean we simply regurgitate both sides and call it a day. We have to frame the comments, we have to frame, go from the facts 
and the framing and context around the work we're doing is particularly important. So I think some people in the audience might be familiar with the facts first branding, mm -hmm. which is something along the lines of this is an apple, it is not a banana, <laughs> it right. is an apple. Um, tell us a little bit more though about this new form of fact checking, the mm -hmm. facts first fact checking right. that you're doing this year. Tell us how many you've already done. Mm -hmm. um, are you happy or unhappy with the way it's rolling out so far? So far? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, fact checking is a, a top priority for CNN and for me personally <laughs> this year. We've always done fact checking at CNN. We've really stepped up our efforts to make it uh, a very regular part of the work we do, a, a muscle that we're exercising every day. Uh, we've aligned our fact checks with our facts branding and actually our bottom line conclusion for fact checking is the facts first conclusion. What I particularly like about the, the new way that we're approaching it is it does get away from the old model which ran the risk of sometimes forcing us a bit into a false equivalence. For example, fact checking a debate. We've done three trues or we've done three falses. Do we need to find a true so that we look balanced? Uh, now we call something out. If it's false, we don't hesitate to say that. I think it's important to be confident in the facts and the bottom line conclusion of where the facts lead us. So if something's wrong, if it's false, we say that very directly. But we don't feel forced into one category or another. We're in the facts first bottom line, we're able to give uh, more nuanced conclusions. Uh, this lacks context or this statement is misleading because. And I think that that's a, an important uh, point for our readers. I think it helps with transparency and it helps us uh, follow the facts in a, a more real way. Um, thank you. Jay, uh, I want to ask you sort of to challenge me and many others because I have often said and written that, you know, if journalism is activism, it's activism for the truth, mm -hmm. that it's our responsibility to always point out what is true and to always call out lies. Do you agree with that? Uh, yeah, I agree with that. Okay. Um, but I disagree with something else you said, um, or I'd like to provide more context for Thank it. You. Um, you said in, in introducing us uh, that uh, we've been talking about false equivalence in journalism for several years, and that is true. Um, but I think that conversation, which is very real now in journalism, didn't come from journalists. It started outside of journalists. And it's only the fact that journalists are frankly, and nobody likes to hear this, on Twitter and they have to hear it and they have to deal with it and I think realize that they don't have a good answer to it. And it was, it was that <laughs> dynamic of being criticized for false equivalence, realizing they're kind of right, and then internalizing that critique so that now it is a regular subject of conversation. But it didn't used to be. Five years ago, it wasn't. That's right. Um, and so we have to keep this in mind, is that it wasn't journalists that <laughs> called out this concept, but now they are responding to it. Um, but haven't you I, written that there, that, you know, the sort of starting point for a lot of people has not been the, a universal view of continuously pointing out lies? Haven't you written that, um, that there have always been alternatives to that approach? Yeah, and this is how we got into this situation in the first place. Um, when, I, when I think about this problem, I, I start with a, a, a really interesting passage I read 20 years ago from um, the Washington Post political reporter, Paul Taylor, who uh, was reflecting in his book on his own habit of looking for that midpoint between the best and the worst that could be said about a politician or, or a proposal and writing his story from that fair-minded place. Rachel, you said something similar just a minute ago when you said at CNN we're coming from a uh, down the middle position. And when Taylor reflected on why he did that, search for the midpoint between the best and the worst that could be said about someone. He recognized that he was, yeah, he's trying to tell the truth, that's part of it, but he's also seeking refuge. 
seeking refuge. And I think that is the key point to remember because that's how journalists got into this position in the first place. The reason that they parade a quote on one side and a quote on another side is, well, there's two. The first reason is it's quick, it's easy, it's fast, it lends itself to uh, a quick production. But the other uh, reason is they're trying to advertise to themselves, to critics, potential critics, and to the viewers, the audience, we're not on anyone's side. Right? They're trying to show that they are not on anyone's side. It's a symbolic act more than it is a, a truth-telling impulse. And Taylor captured it when he said, I'm seeking truth, yeah, but I'm also seeking refuge. So another reason why I think false equivalence has now become such an issue and journalists themselves talk about it is that they're slowly realizing there is no refuge. So you might as well tell the truth. You see what I mean? So that's the origin, I think, of this practice. It's always been a dubious practice, and now it's coming under well-deserved scrutiny. Well, I would say that uh, certainly in the 90s, when I was coming up in newsrooms, I remember my editor saying, well, if both sides are mad at you, mm -hmm. you know, it wasn't even that I was getting email, and <laughs> I was getting right. angry phone calls from both sides in an article, and they would say, well, if both sides are mad at you, you're doing something right, kid. Right. You know, that was what was drilled into And that was part you. of that. Yeah. And, that, and the, re the, the reply to that is if both sides are angry at you, it's possible you're doing something right. It's also possible you're doing everything wrong. <laughs> exactly. Well, I mean, Jay, just a quick segue onto that. Uh, do you even believe that objectivity exists? Well, objectivity, the way we talk about it in American journalism, means like 55 different things. Um, and some of them I am a big fan of, and some of them I think are, are really dubious. Um, this part that we've been talking about, the ritual of balance, the way false balance creeps in, is one of the um, least attractive and least productive parts of objectivity. But objectivity means other things too. It means, for example, getting beyond the limited perspective that your own uh, upbringing and class situation uh, would give you. That's kind of a kind of objectivity. I think that's great. Um, ob objectivity can be um, uh, providing the facts without trying to say whether they're good or bad. I think that's a valid thing to do. Um, uh, but when objectivity is used like you uh, uh, just uh, explained, uh, that if you're getting criticism from both sides, that is some sort of proof that you're doing a good job, I think that's a garbage notion. It doesn't help you. And so objectivity is, is kind of like, it's become like this uh, pinata in journalism. People just take swipes at it, including me. But usually when people have this conversation, they're, each person is talking about a different part of this beast objectivity. Well, I want to drill down on one aspect of that, which is we all come, you know, into life and as we grow up with different perspectives, different socioeconomic backgrounds, different ethnic backgrounds, different values. Yes. So the whole notion to me of objectivity makes no sense. We're human beings, we're not robots coming to the table as a blank slate. What I think you can be is completely fair and completely accurate. It's not clear to me that objectivity as the view from nowhere, that everybody should come with some, you know, equivalent original view, that doesn't make sense because that doesn't exist. We're all humans. Yeah. Well, well, let me just say one more thing on this because I think this is important. In the U.S., we, we've had a 30-year project to try and diversify the American newsroom, bring diversity to the American newsroom. And almost everybody is frustrated with it because it really hasn't worked. We don't have enough of a diverse newsroom after a long effort. And I think part of the reason for it, I'm just saying part of the reason, is that uh, objectivity the way you just described it is in fact still in place. And if on the one hand you recruit people into the, your newsroom because you need diverse points of view, and on the other hand you tell those people when they arrive that they should cleanse their work of a point of view, then you set up a situation where they're going to fail or feel frustrated right away. 
And I believe this is the reason that the diversity project, in, at least in the American uh, sphere, has, has failed. The bosses wanted a diverse newsroom. I don't think they were cynical. I think they wanted that. They also wanted the view from nowhere. They couldn't have both, but they went ahead anyway. And it hasn't worked. Interesting. All right, well, that may come up in the questions. Craig, I know that you believe that with disinformation in social media, um, that journalism ethics need to be brought up to date to mesh with um, a really changing digital landscape. I know that you think the media can rebuild trust by stopping the amplification, amplification of lies and disinformation, especially going into the 2020 election, but what are the, some, of the, some of the solutions that you think will actually work? Okay. I'm very much an outsider, and my approach with a lot of philanthropy is to find people who are really good at something and then give them the resources that they need to move forward. In two broad areas, well, I've recently funded the folks at Pointer and the folks at the Columbia J School to establish uh, centers of excellence uh, on ethics and some related matters because I can raise issues like that of false equivalence or the idea of uh, giving airtime to people who you know are going to uh, disinform you, but that should really be raised by uh, professionals, and I'm not one. Tangentially, the effort at Columbia also has a component which has to do with the protection for journalists. I'm helping out about 17 different modest efforts to help keep journalists safe, but that's another topic. Um, from another perspective, I'm also funding different groups like uh, folks at the Columbia J School, uh, but also the uh, journal Graduate Journalism School at CUNY, uh, and folks at Data and Society led by <coughs> Dana Boyd, trying to understand how information warfare in the form of disinformation enters news ecosystems, then how that influences more conventional news, which actually does damage to the country. Uh, this is a matter of information warfare, oddly as predicted perfectly by Marshall McLuhan in 1970. And he said something about World War III being uh, an information guerrilla war waged equally by civilians and the military. Um, he was right in that quote. Uh, the heads of major military across the world have admitted they're at war right now. That's what we're seeing. So again, I'm finding people who are doing good jobs, who are doing well at analyzing this kind of warfare, beginning to fight back and uh, do something about it. The theme again, find people who are really good at something, get them some resources, get them to talk with each other, get them to defend themselves. And my role is uh, mostly to get out of the way uh, unless I can be funny. <laughs> Um, Rachel, well, please be funny no matter what happens. We need that. I'm, I'm not as funny as I think high, I am. Though. Um, Rachel, I want to ask you something really that's come out of the news in the U.S. in the last week or so, and um, hopefully our non-American friends might know a little bit about it, but they were also busy with their own issues like Brexit and lots of other things. Um, do you think U.S. journalists were wrong to press aggressively on the Mueller investigation, should journalists have sat back and waited for the findings? And really, is the Mueller report even over? Is it, is it time for us to kind of do the postmortems and move on and leave it behind us, or is there more to do? So you can take those one by one. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think that journalists follow the facts and report aggressively, that is our job. Uh, it's our job to ask questions, to ask questions of a uh, president, to hold our lawmakers accountable, and if there is an investigation into uh, any of our public officials, we should be asking questions and reporting on that. So I think that's what uh, journalists did in their coverage of the Mueller investigation. I think in any investigation, as we bring reporting to our audiences, and, and we have some incredibly talented reporters at CNN who did that very well, it's important to be transparent, to let audiences know 
uh, what we do know, what we've found out so far, and also what we don't know. We don't want to be predictive. We don't know uh, all the facets of what investigators are looking at. We know one piece. So I think having that context in our coverage and reporting is very important. Uh, the, the Mueller investigation is over. The reporting about it is not. We've seen Attorney General Barr's summary of a 300, more than a 300 page report. We're still pressing for the release of the report because that's what journalists do. We, we press for transparency. Uh, so we have not seen that yet uh, and therefore the story is not over. We're still asking, we've seen uh, 101 words from Mueller out of a more than 300 page report. So we, we have the Attorney General's summary of the conclusions. We have not seen the conclusions themselves. So we'll keep asking those questions. At the same time, I think it's important to realize that uh, our audiences have many other topics that they're interested in and that we should be reporting on. We have a 2020 presidential campaign gearing up with uh, many candidates on the Democratic side to ask questions of. We have issues like health care, which uh, the Trump administration has uh, pivoted their position in the last week or two on that. That's a, a very important and significant topic uh, in the U.S. and for our audiences. There's enormous audience interest in that. So I think delving into those kinds of uh, policy issues as well is an important facet of our coverage. So when we're covering something, I, we, we do want to drill down. We want to uh, put resources and reporting time into it. We also need to be mindful that there are many other issues to cover and devote attention to as well. Craig, you wanted to jump in? Um, there's uh, opportunities relating to uh, the Mueller report or related matters. Uh, I can go on at length, but a, a relatively easy one is simply uh, looking at the U.S. federal government, seeing if uh, cybersecurity has improved or decreased in the last couple of years. Uh, take a look at staffing levels. Take a look at specific uh, actions taken by the administration. There is a uh, very big story there, and here I am speaking as a, uh, well, an old time uh, computer nerd. But uh, uh, if, you want, if you took a look, you might be disturbed to see how, uh, how much stronger or possibly weaker is the U.S. is in terms of uh, protecting its secrets, the electrical grid, grid uh, voting systems, and uh, so on. In Georgia, for example, uh, there's been uh, hacking, state-sponsored hacking, done right out in the open in the clear with no consequence. That's a long story. There are opportunities there for stories to be told. Um, Rachel, though, one thing you said, you said that journalists covering the Mueller report did do it sort of following the facts. And I think that's true of your journalists on CNN Digital, politics. Um, but there's no doubt that people who appeared on cable news, some of whom are journalists, mm -hmm. some of whom are commentators, some of whom are journalists for other news organizations who come on your air and MSNBC and Fox in the guise mm -hmm. of being an analyst, that many people said things that were beyond what they had actually reported. They were speculative, they were out in front of their skis, and a lot of blame has been heaped on cable news specifically for commentators. So. What's your reaction to that? Because the average news consumer can't really distinguish between an article in CNN Digital or even the New York Times versus seeing a CNN person make commentary or a New York Times reporter make commentary on mm -hmm. cable news. There are certainly panelists who express opinions and uh, come to our coverage with various viewpoints. Again, I, I think the key is to uh, balance out the coverage. I do not mean balance in terms of false equivalence. I mean balance as in different facets of coverage. So there is some commentary 
uh, we have to be, again, facts-led, led through the uh, excellent reporting of beat reporters at CNN. We have to be transparent in our labeling. So on digital, we're very clear in our labeling of opinion and analysis pieces. I often lead uh, my politics site, and we often lead the homepage in the morning uh, with analysis, uh, many times by a writer named Stephen Collinson, who's uh, fantastic. He spent his career with AFP before he came to us, and those are clearly labeled analysis pieces. I think one of the, um, the challenges for us right now is to help audiences navigate all of the information that is coming at them and help them understand what it means. Uh, now, again, we, we have to put that into context of what we know and we don't know. We should not be predictive or uh, act as though we know more than we do. But at the same time, only putting um, facts with no context forward does not help our audiences navigate. So balancing the coverage to have the reporting that we're breaking and also to have clearly labeled analysis around the reporting to help people connect the dots and just see how things might fit together, again, with the caveats that we don't have the full story. Jay, I want to ask you to, um, to tell us, I mean, fact-checking as we know it now is much more robust and developed as a niche within journalism than it was, say, five years ago. Um, but what special problems do politicians like Donald Trump um, or uh, Duterte in the Philippines or Orban in Hungary um, or Sisi in Egypt, there are a number, um, what, what sort of challenges do those politicians present towards our fact-checking system as it is and what's fragile about our much vaunted fact-checking system? Be happy to answer that, but I, I also wanted to make a comment on the, um, the coverage of the Mueller case. Um, I think it's important to recognize just how extraordinary this story has been. Um, I certainly can't think of anything in my lifetime that's even remotely parallel to it in, in this way. First, you had a hugely important story for America as a mature democracy. Was this election stolen? What could be more important than that in, in a way? Um, then you had, add to that, that this is especially a factor for cable news, that there was huge demand for news coverage of the story every day, mm -hmm. whether there was news or not that day. And um, television producers in particular, but not just them, editors, people running websites, are seeing the signs of that demand, mm -hmm. whether there is news or not. So people want to hear about it, whether there's anything to hear about or not. And that's the setting in which somebody goes from just the facts to speculating, right? Because speculating is one of the things you can do to fill that gap. So you had that as a second factor. Then a third factor, which is really extraordinary in modern day Washington, as both of you can testify, the Mueller investigation did not release any information yeah. for two years. No leaks. No leaks, nothing, no announcements no developments officially coming. So you had this huge demand for news and you had the central actor refusing to give any news, right, for two years on a story that people are desperate to know about. So you have to keep that in mind as well. And to add to it all, constant attacks from the most powerful person in the culture for the coverage, claiming that it is unfair, claiming that Journalists are promoting collusion; that they are that they are themselves driving that um, that that storyline. And so, when you put all those things together, that's a very difficult thing to um, cope with. And I'm not surprised that at the end of the investigation, it released this wave of attacks on journalists for for doing their job. Um, now, your question was about what? <laughs> Just give me the key word and I'll it, remember. It was about um, the, the special problems that politicians, including right, but okay. not limited to Trump, give fact to fact checkers yeah. and how fragile the system is. Right. So 
Glenn Kessler, who is the fact checker for the Washington Post and has been doing this for quite a while, um, observed that uh, before Trump, almost all candidates and presidents would respond to fact checking in a particular way. If they were making a claim that was shown by not just one journalist, but let's say the consensus among, uh, among the fact checkers, shown to be false or misleading, they wouldn't like throw up their hands and say, you got me, I was wrong. Um, but they would change their behavior. They would, they would alter the claim. They would, they would revise it so that it wasn't false. And, then, and they would still try to make the same point, but they would eliminate the part that kind of upset the fact checkers. And this was the pattern for years. And uh, Trump comes along and he completely blows that up. He keeps saying things that are false after they've been fact checked. And he doesn't care if there's a penalty uh, uh, you know, extracted on him by journalists. In fact, it's not just that he doesn't care if journalists are calling him a liar. He actually wants to bring that on because that situation of journalists calling Trump a liar is exactly what motivates his supporters uh, and, and uh, activates them to um, feel their guy is under attack mm -hmm. and that it's uh, the press that's doing it. And so that's a completely different situation because um, now you have fact-checking is not only um, powerless to stop him, but it's actually used to further his movement. And under those conditions, fact-checking as we know it in the, like its first generation simply has, has to be better, has to change, it has to do something different. So because by now, best. the Washington Post is up to 8,000 lies and false statements that Trump has made in three years. And he's doubled down on it. Yeah, and it's getting worse, right? It's, it's become getting more days. In fact, if you took a typical Trump speech at a rally, and you isolated every truth claim in the speech, and then fact-checked it, there would probably be more false claims than true ones in a typical Trump talk. Craig, I know you wanted to respond to that. And you know, I speak in a position of some ignorance as an outsider, and I'm funding these uh, ethics groups to pose questions like this, such that uh, um, in the, are there cases where if the uh, probability of, of uh, deception coming from a, a public figure, if that's pretty high, or if it's recorded and you, you know, you know the, that the person has lied, is it ethical to present uh, that lie in print or on, the, it, or on the air at all? There's different groups like the Trust Project, Reporters Without Borders, trying to codify this in terms of codes of ethics uh, with results. As a news consumer, I'm uh, eager to hear about this because it affects uh, my decisions, both in terms of what news outlets to pay attention to, but also what, uh, well, it affects my perception of advertisers. For example, if an advertiser is supporting a news outlet, which is knowingly spreading disinformation what does that tell me about the advertiser? Uh, I don't have an answer for that right now, but I'm hoping the groups I'm supporting can help me make this uh, ethical buying decision. Well, I want to go to questions from the audience, but you know, one thought on that is just the idea that there are, I, I've talked to a uh, big, big journalist in American journalism, someone who everyone knows, a big editor, and said, aren't you concerned that there are just some people who are unpersuadables? You know, people who no matter how many fact checks you give them, their identity is based on not believing the press and believing their guy, so you can fact check from now till the cows come home and they're not gonna believe it. And this person wouldn't say that on stage, um, but after we got off the stage, this person said, of course they're under persuadables, but you know, we have to be working for everyone else, um, even if there's some people who are never gonna believe fact checks. All right, let's- Can I, can I just make one point on that? I think that's important though, because it is not our job as journalists to persuade people, unless you're an opinion writer or you're on the editorial board. Our job is to convey the facts and to convey the information with the needed context and then 
our audiences, our viewers, our readers decide what to do uh, with that information. So I think starting from a place of trying to persuade people puts us in a position that we shouldn't be in. We need to just do our jobs, uh, make the best decisions we can about what we're presenting and how we're presenting it, and then audiences will take from that what they choose to take from that. Uh, totally they, disagree. Okay. 100%. All right, go ahead. It's true that reporters shouldn't be involved in persuading people to join this campaign or vote for that candidate when they cover politics. That part is true. But every day, journalists are involved in persuading people to uh, take the public world seriously, um, uh, care about the news, mm -hmm. uh, listen to arguments on both sides, um, pay attention to an ongoing story. All of those things require persuasion. In fact, uh, objectivity itself is best understood as a form of persuasion in this sense. Um, a, a journalist practicing that form of journalism is trying to say to people, look, I don't have a position here. I don't have a philosophy. I don't have a stake. I don't have an interest. I'm just telling you the way it is, so believe it because this is the facts, mm -hmm. right? That is an act of persuasion. And if people don't buy that act of persuasion, you're dead in the water as a journalist. So journalism is full of persuasion, even though it's not supposed to be propaganda or enlisted in a cause that is um, being uh, you know, under conflict within the political sphere. So if I can just uh, jump back in to answer that, I, I think Jay and I actually agree we're just defining persuasion differently. I, I absolutely agree. It all depends on what your definition is, right? I absolutely agree that we as a mission try to get people to care about the world and to care about the news and to care about storytelling uh, and, and to take an, an active interest in the world around them. I'm using persuasion in the sense of taking a particular course of action. In, a, in covering a campaign, for example, it is not our job to persuade people to come to uh, a particular cl conclusion about one side. We present the facts, again, not through the regurgitation, but facts first with context. And then people take of it what they will. Certainly, though, we want our audiences to be invested in the world around them and to care about that. So we, we do very much agree on that point. It's funny that you say that because I have talked to fact checkers on panels, too, and asked them, well, if uh, you know there are all these fact checks that you've done, but you haven't changed anyone's decision making, aren't you failing? And one of them said back to me very, you know, hotly, well, it's not my job to change how people vote. Uh, I was talking about fact-checking of Brexit, for example, that even with all the fact-checks, people still voted. They said, well, that may be true. There's some studies that showed that people said, well, everything you're saying, how about it's not going to help the UK economy may be true, but I'm still going to vote for Brexit. And the same had, was studied with Trump's election, that people said, well, even if he did say those words in that Access Hollywood tape, and even if he did do X, Y, and Z, okay, you've convinced me that he did those things, or that this fact he says is not a fact, it's false, but I'm still going to vote for him. So the, the, what was interesting was the perception that, you know, certainly people are free to take our facts and our information and use them as they wish, but we would like them to believe the facts, I, I think. You know, we would like them to believe the facts, and after that they have their free will. If they say, well, I don't care about those facts, I, this is still my guy, mm -hmm. I don't know that we can control people in that way or that that's their role, but we do want them to believe the facts. All right, let me see some hands from the audience of um, people who have questions. All right, first I saw the lady in the back with the very well-behaved baby. Could we uh, <laughs> That could is we an take, exceptionally well-behaved baby. Could we take the mic to her, please? The baby. Okay, well, <laughs> the baby might have a better question than all the rest of us, but how about uh, the lady? Hi. Uh, and please identify yourself. Yes, my name is Alessia Shmagun. I'm from Russia. Okay. And uh, this discussion was uh, very interesting, especially because from the distance in Russia, we see what is going on in American journalism from a slightly different perspective. 
Uh, I actually have many questions, but I will focus on one. Thank you. <laughs> so um, the question is, uh, you told in the beginning that uh, uh, in the era of fake news, you've become to new approach. <laughs> and journalism from both sides should be presented to fa false equivalent. And that uh, obje objectivity doesn't exist. That's Sonia. <laughs> I don't think they were advocating for false equivalents. I think they were saying uh, they want to present things in a way that is facts first rather than giving false equivalents. Okay, so my question is uh, this approach that objectivity in journalism doesn't exist, don't you think it uh, actually enforces people who believe, let's say, trap supporters? If objectivity does not exist, why should we trust CNN uh, instead of Trump? And uh, if uh, like, who decided what is fake and what is not fake? Okay, thank you. We'll take that. I've written it down. And the next question, I see a lady right here in the front. Yeah. Yes, a mic is coming to you here in the front because we're going to take a trio of questions and then answer them together. Um, uh, I'm Yasmin by brown I'm a columnist in the United Kingdom, and I'm glad you mentioned Brexit because research done by Epsos Mori and others have shown that people over this horrendous period we are going through prefer to believe, do not care. It's perceptions rather than facts that now matter. And perceptions have now become the truth. And facts, and this is quite, and Peter, uh, what's his name? Fintan O'Toole wrote a very persuasive piece in the Irish Times about the dangers of what this means in what he calls the pre-fascist times we have entered across Europe. So it seems to me the fact, fact, fact emphasis of the panel is forgetting where we now are. It's not just the Trump situation, it's that what people want to believe is what they believe. Thank you. Do we have a third question, this gentleman in the front here? If we could get the mic over to him. And please identify yourself as well. Hi, so my name is Mario. I'm from Redefined Startup. And um, the question is extending, you touched on it a little bit, but extending this idea of false equivalency to the audience, especially given so many of the panels here in this conference are about bringing the audience into the newsroom, membership, all this kind of stuff. And uh, how do you manage if you talk about unpersuadables and not giving airtime uh, to people who don't deserve it? How do you manage that in the context of the hot topic of censorship and the fact that uh, statistics show that, for example, comment sections or other visible areas is what people will often remember more than the news itself? Uh, so how do you manage that? Okay, good. So the first question was from Alyssa from Russia, and it was about many things, but it seemed to also be about who decides what's fake, if I got that right, and, um, and you know, are we promoting false equivalents? Maybe um, Jay or Rachel, if one of you could tackle it, if you felt there was a part of the question that you could respond to. Because she was also mentioning television and different perceptions in Russia from perceptions we have in the US. Um, well, she wanted to know if objectivity is um, impossible, doesn't that lead to validating the criticisms of Trump supporters that the press is on. Uh, um, but I don't, I didn't say objectivity is impossible. Yeah, I, I said different, so part, it means many different things and some parts are valuable and some are not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Rachel, did you want to add I, something? I think I would suggest focusing more on uh, fairness. For example, if we are writing a story about the Trump administration and we don't include a comment from the Trump administration or at least an attempt to reach out to them, they can decide if they want to comment or not. That would be a flaw in the journalism. We want to be fair. Again, we represent different viewpoints. We bring them to our coverage on all platforms, on, on digital, on social, on the air. That doesn't mean we allow people to say unchecked things that are not factually based. So we have to represent those viewpoints and we have to give the context around them. If we know someone is saying something false, we need to call that out in our coverage. Okay. And um, the second question from the columnist from the UK was about the idea that 
facts don't matter anymore to people, even if they know they're facts, that people are more shaped by perceptions. And this is true not only of Brexit, but other things. And she referred to pre-fascist times that we're facing across Europe. Um, and what do you do in that situation when people are responding emotionally and tribally and not responding to facts? Who would like to address that? I think that? that's a very real thing. And to the degree that people's views are fixed and facts as they unfold don't matter, and they are sort of self-consciously in that situation of kind of warding off information, that in the degree those conditions exist, journalism cannot actually operate. Um, and I think the space for journalism is, in fact, shrinking for that reason. There are definitely, in the United States, whole sections of the electorate that are, in a sense, immune to journalism right now. And if they are going to be brought back in, into the circle of, of a fact-based debate and, and news, it's going to take an act of persuasion, as I indicated before. Did anyone else want to add to that? OK. The th did you have something you well, wanted to add? The yeah, the third question. Oh, sorry. No, I, I do want to hear more from the baby. <laughs> there's a, there's I, a third question. <laughs> the third question was from Mario from the startup, who was saying, "Well, if you have unpersuadables, and if you, you know, say, well, we're not going to give airtime to proven liars or manipulators," he asked about uh, how does this intersect with fears of about censorship. Uh, and. This one I speak from the, uh, my bias is formed by the uh, Bill of Rights and the Declaration and so on. And censorship is a government activity. Uh, free speech is, does not include speech which is fraudulent or deceptive or deliberate uh, disinformation. So the words actually do matter, but that's the uh, bias I have again. Fraudulent speech, speech intended to deceive, that's not a free speech issue. And I, I appreciate that you pointed out the fact that censorship, at least in our system, refers to government censorship. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, I am speaking from a very traditional American attitude, and I realize that's only one perspective mm -hmm. out of many globally. It's just, that the only one, it's just the only one I really understand. Um, Rachel and Jay, do you want to add to that at all? No? OK. I think we have time for one last question. Uh, he's making, he's, he's <laughs> it's not 12 yet. <laughs> All right, I'm being told no. So um, with that, any closing quick thoughts from any of you? Do you have any final takeaways you want to give to folks before we leave? I think journalists are in the fight of their lives, not with Trump, but with um, a whole section of the country that has become immune to the work they do. Mm -hmm. Rachel, closing thought? I appreciate the discussion. This is fundamental to the work that we do. And I'm proud of the work that we do. I think we need to be constantly uh, gut checking ourselves to make sure that we're in the right place to think about how we can serve our audiences to the absolute best of our ability and continue to uh, strive to be better every single day. Thank you, Craig. I just wish I was funny. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, you got to laugh. Um, please join me in thanking Craig and Rachel and Jay for their frank insights and analysis. Thank you, guys.